Father God, we just ask you right now to give us discernment and wisdom and right understanding and application. What I've seen this morning is a lamb, a lamb, the, the front of a lamb, but the back of a lion. And I was seeing the tail come around and touch the lamb's heart where there was blood and then come over us to touch us. So, Father, we thank you for your son, the lion and the lamb. Father, we thank you for his blood. And we ask, Father, that it would just be applied to every doorpost in us, Lord, every opening, God, every place where there's a gate or an entrance, Father, that you would just place the blood of the Lamb over every doorpost, over our families, over our homes. And we thank you that Jesus is all in all, that he comes as the Savior, and he comes as the lion to remove the enemy from our midst and from within us. Father, we thank you and we ask that you would just increase our faith and trust that you have everything covered, Lord. Every opening, Lord, every crack, that the blood is sufficient and we ask for that application and right understanding, God, that we could partner with you, Lord, where there are doors that need to be shut, that we would participate with you in closing those. And Lord, I just keep thinking of the womb. Lord, I thank you that that is yet another gate. We ask for the blood of the lamb to be placed over the womb. We ask for safe delivery. And we bless you, Father, because your love never fails. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you in all I Your 
love has called my name and I've been born again to your family your blood flows through my veins I'm no longer
started dropping a prophetic word in me this morning. And I was, I'm glad you guys are here. I'm looking at Judah and Andrew. He started dropping this prophetic word in me this morning, and I knew that we would have guests and that we would have a big crowd. And so I was like, great, I'll give it next week. But when he really wants me to move out, I get all trembly like I am right now. So here's the word. One of the reasons Donald Trump is our president is because he launched a men's liberation movement. I was an adolescent during the women's liberation movement and the sexual revolution. And I remember thinking, this is so wrong. There is no male, there's no female in the body of Christ. And yes, Jesus was the liberator of women and we should be walking in that liberation and we should be walking in that empowerment, but not at the expense of honoring men. It is an abomination in the sight of God, and it's the work of principalities and powers, and you know their names, and I will not advertise them this morning. I am thrilled to be in a church where so many women receive and deliver prophetic words, and where we have a woman pastor who's as empowered as, as a senior pastor as Rick is, and I am so delighted that there are movies out there like The Lord of the Rings that ends with a woman, spoiler alert, beheading the dragon. I love that. But you know, there's also something called the mighty men of God. There was a movie called Armageddon that ought to get our attention. A movie called Armageddon where a bunch of roughnecks went up into the heart of the beast and killed it and saved the world at the cost of some of their lives. And they were roughnecks. They were roughnecks. They were not men of righteousness, but they laid down their lives. And who of us claims righteousness anyway, except in the blood of Christ? So what I want to say is this. I am sorry and I repent for my generation of women choosing to put down and dishonor men and to think that our empowerment had to come at the expense of yours. I apologize and I repent for a generation that has taken maleness and made it some kind of disease, some kind of mental illness, because you can't sit still in school. I would be afraid if you could sit still in school. We shouldn't have put a label on it. We shouldn't have made it into a disease. We shouldn't have made positions like policemen and firemen and military men, people to be scorned or called names. It's a disgrace, and I repent of that spirit. And I want to pour a little fuel on this fire started by Donald J. Trump to say, maybe there's a reason why he's la the Lord allows him to continue tweeting and doing and saying things that make us all cringe. Maybe it's because he's trying to say, this is the age of grace. And if I want to use a man who's still a little bit of a roughneck, that is my pleasure. So men, I invite you, I'm, not, I'm only going to read a passage here, I'm going to decree it, and hopefully all of you here will decree it together in the spirit with me. But read Isaiah 49. This is to you. Before I was born, the Lord called me. 
From my birth he has made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand and my reward is with my God. In Jesus' name, I just declare that the men of the church, not just this church, the men of the church of Jesus Christ will be launched out of the quiver and into the heart of the beast in Jesus' name. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears are drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. Yes, I am.
minutes ago, I felt one of the major things the Lord was doing was bringing his tender love to our hearts. I want to go back to that for a minute. I was thinking about all the times that uh, the early days especially when my hero Smith Wigglesworth, he uh, said he broke hundreds of times before the Lord, meaning the Holy Spirit coming and humbling you and loving you and although he didn't say that that's what happened to me I raised my hands I said I want that and this morning it was a, a different kind of brokenness it was a tenderness before the Lord breaking up fallow ground releasing praise in our heart but it's the tender love of God that changes hearts conviction of sin amen Powerful preaching, amen, gifts of the Spirit, yes. But God is love. And I just want you to hold on to that. No distractions. The tender love of God is available as we seek Him. I tell people, you can find the Lord always in your prayer closet. That's where he hangs out, you know. And uh, to know the love of God, John said, we know and rely on the love that God has for us. And he said, love casts out fear. But he said in 1 John 4, 7, love comes from God. So I want to pray that over you before we go on. And Anything else, Lord, I want to thank you for the tender love of God that was really ministering, I think, to many of us today. And I want to thank you for just that sweet song at the end that helped us be brought back into that. Lord, I pray that here in every church that the love of God would take over. You want to pray that with me? Say, Heavenly Father, your word says that love comes from God. Come here. Come into my heart and help me, Holy Spirit, to be open to the love of God in painful places, shameful places, even prideful places in my heart. I welcome the tender love of God to conform me into your image. Help me in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. That's what I want for you today. I know that's what the Lord wants. So bless you today. We're thankful that you're here. We have some wonderful folks all the way from the East Coast here. And uh, Tom and Marianne Hardiman, they oversee the churches nationally and internationally of Morning Star Ministries under Rick Joyner, of which we were fortunate enough to be accepted in there. So they're here today. And we want you to be blessed and encouraged and strengthened. This is Tom Hardiman, and uh, yeah, amen. Yeah. Uh, I, I really love them. We're getting to know them more and more. Beautiful wife, Marianne. Stand up, Marianne. Just here she is. Okay. Amen. Yeah. They do national and international ministry. Been in the ministry uh, 40 years or 55 years, whatever, 40 years. <laughs> I think we both, have you been in ministry 40 years? We have. In, 40. Yeah, 40, us too. I don't know why we all start at the same time. but Four, uh, Actually, 41. 41. Oh, yeah. I think we're into our 42nd or 41st, whatever. Anyway, I want you to receive him. He really is a wonderful man and woman of God, his wife. I hope she'll come up here for a little bit or something. But we Good. fell in love with them, and we're falling in love with them more and more every day. And as they're staying with us another night, and we're very thankful, Tom. So... You're at home, bro. That was very awesome. Yeah. So you're at home, buddy. Yeah, you're at home. Well, good morning, everybody. We thank you for having us. And um, we're trusting the Lord for this morning. We believe that God has been speaking to us. And so 
What, where I'd like to begin this morning is I have some prophetic words that I'd like to share with some of you. Rick, I had a word for you. And uh, the word is, it's a phrase. Because something is hidden doesn't make it any less valuable. And I believe uh, there was someone that shared Isaiah 49 today. And part of Isaiah 49 was, after the arrow is formed, God hides it in his quiver. And you've been hidden for a while, both for a season of time that God wants you to emerge, and also for your own protection. Because there were, there were, there were things around you that, like a child is hidden in the womb, there were things that were not fully developed for you. But there's coming a delivery time. Uh, it, it will, you will be prepared for the pressures and the demands that, will, that are going to be on your life. And this is not your only place of residence. And I want to say this to this church. Um, there are some people here, and I, I, I bless this church. I, I, we've gotten to know some of you just a little bit. But there are some people here that are going to need to step up in order for the fullness of what God wants to do in this region, some people that um, have gifts and can carry the load of what God wants to place on this church to shoulder the load fully, it's going to be necessary for people to move from a casual participation in this church to bearing loads. And that will enable the destiny, the corporate destiny of this ministry to begin to be fulfilled. It would be great if when you're gone in the future, you weren't worried about what was going on at home. And so it will be necessary for people to step up to do that. I, I'm very impressed with the uh, intercessory teams that um, we met yesterday. There's more load to carry. I saw this church somewhat like um, a man that had his finger in the dike. And there, was, there were other places throughout this dike that were, where there were leaks. And I saw that there was a prevention of certain things from happening because of the intercession. And I believe God wants you to uh, think in larger terms. Because your presence here is in truth it is deferring some judgment that God wants to bring against aspects of evil that, that unfold in this nation. The presence of the salt of the earth is causing delays in that, and it's a good thing. Okay, so um, the, I, I can share with you more about this uh, because something's hidden later, but there's coming a time, and it's very valuable. But God, it's not for today. It, it's coming, getting ready to unfold. I, I, and there's, there, I, I'll get into it in a minute. If you have more stuff, I'll... I just have one last thing. Um, so it's probably directed to you too, but it's also to the congregation. And so yesterday we were at the 8 to 10 prayer meeting here. And I feel like that is your main emphasis is intercession for this church. And I said yesterday that there, I felt like this place was a watering hole. However, it, and it is bigger than you think. And so as I came in here, I was asking the Lord, what do you have for the congregation? And I felt like you guys have been in the secret place of the Most High, again, Psalm 91. But I'm going to show you this. Well, this is what I saw is what is happening with your intercession. This is um, after 9-11, the World Trade Center. You may have seen these pictures. Um, what was there is no longer there, and what they put there were high beam lights that shoot up. And so that there's now two towers of light that go up into the heavens. And um, I'm, oh, did you see that, or did my phone just shut off? Oh my goodness. Okay. Yeah, I held it so long. 
There you go. Can you see that? The, yeah. uh, I'm so sorry, I don't have that. I, I couldn't uh, see it, but that's good. Well, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> but that's what I feel like um, your intercession is doing. It's two towers of light going right up into the heavens. But this is the scripture that God gave me for this, and it's Acts 10, and it's about Cornelius and how he had prayed. And I got to read it exactly the way it says it. So in Acts 10, and I had to move my finger, so let me just get there. It's right in the beginning. And it's so powerful. It's in verse um, 4. Uh, so the angel comes to Cornelius, and he says, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze on him, and being much alarmed, he said, What is it, Lord? And the angel said to him, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. A memorial to me is like the Washington Memorial. And that that is what has happened, is those prayers just don't evaporate. They just don't vanish, but they accumulate and become a Washington more Memorial, if, if you will, uh, uh, that rises up into the heavens. And that's why the Lord gave me this picture of the World Trade Center, because this is exactly what is happening with the prayers. They are rising up into the heavens, and they're being illuminated, and God is waiting for the, the bowls of prayer to be filled. And when they are filled, and you keep praying, is how they get filled. And as you keep interceding and interceding for your city, I feel like those bowls, well, they are. They will tip, and God will then move. But I felt like there is so, it is essential that the call is not just for a few of you, but it is a call for your congregation. It is an intercessory group that, that's your strength. And that's what God is calling this place to be, a beacon for the L.A. area. And, and it will change the atmosphere. So those those prayers are going up and illuminating the heavens, and it will change on earth as it is in heaven. So, amen. You know, uh, do you guys, anybody know who Bob Jones was? One of the first words that he gave me when I got to Morningstar, we've been at Morningstar 16 years. And uh, we pastored before that for 25 years in New Jersey. One of the first words that uh, Bob gave me was he said, stop preparing. And I used to be a real diligent preparer when I was going to speak. And, and um, boy, was he right. Uh, most often when I do any preparation for a message, it changes. And with what Marianne just said, it changed again. So I may not use the notes that I just gave to the woman over uh, doing the overheads. I'm not sure how all this is going to work uh, this morning. So just pray with me a second and see how we're supposed to how we're supposed to go here. Lord, help. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Okay, here's where we're going to go. Um, so I'm, I, I may use some of this, but I don't think so. I don't. We'll see. Um, <clears throat> when Paul was writing some of his epistles, uh, he was he had interaction with churches that he had started. And in some of these places, uh, when he was writing to them, he had a sense of where the church was presently, even though that he was not with them. And uh, Paul had some 
extraordinary experiences that would not be commonplace for most of us, but we would certainly desire some of the experiences that he had. And so I'm going to talk about his interaction with the church at Ephesus to begin with. And uh, Paul, Paul was the one that birthed that church. And Paul had a, what I would say is a corporate understanding of the purpose for which God intended to have that church fulfill. It's, it, it, it's, it's like this. We all have individual purposes in our lives. And I, I, I want to tell you this, is that the individual purpose for you, and you may realize this, but the individual purpose for you, if we were to identify when the Bible says that was uh, designed, there's two terms in the Bible. One is at the foundations, and the other is before the foundations. And so before God, before Genesis 1, when God was even alone in the heavens, and it was just himself, it was in that time frame that God formed the purposes and the destiny that he had for you. And it's, it says in Ephesians, one of the things that Paul is endeavoring to persuade that church about was that God had a purpose for them before the foundation. And that as you page your way through the chapters of that book, he says that there were preordained works that God designed for each of them. And that it, we, we use words like destiny. And that's an appropriate word. There, it, it, there's, there's terms in the book of Ephesians like predestined unto good works. And he has preordained places and things that he wants you to do that he's designed. But one of the often quoted places in the book of Ephesians is in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, and he's praying for them. And so what, as you read through the, the six chapters of this book, particularly in the first three chapters, he's endeavoring to open their eyes to see the significance of the purpose not only that they had as individuals, but the corporate purpose they had as a congregation. And so he's writing that, and his words continue to reverberate down through history. And it can be applied to local churches today but I, I, I believe that one of the things that God wants to highlight this morning is that God's, God's asking that the eyes of our understanding would be illuminated or enlightened. And in, in all of that, we can conclude this, is that God, had, God has something in mind that we haven't quite seen yet, or God has something in mind that we haven't fully embraced yet. Can you, can you accept that as a premise for where I would like to go in this message? God, there are things that God wants to do in all of our lives that are really perhaps, I don't want to say perhaps, I'm persuaded that we haven't seen it yet. It's like there's this veil that has come over us and the significance of what God wants to do would sound unbelievable to you. And so Paul, periodically throughout the first three chapters, is going to say things like that God wants to show through the church the manifold wisdom of God. Wow. Now it's like, well... I, I, I'm, I'm a servant of the living God. I would like to do his will, and I would like to get through tomorrow. And Paul's saying, your thinking is not quite correct because God wants to show and demonstrate through the church 
the manifold wisdom of God. Now, for all you people that follow any athletic events out there, periodically when you're following a team or whatever it is, like now we have the NFL, every once in a while on these TVs you will see a play and you will go, oh my, did that actually happen? Because it's beyond the normal practice of what is there. And it's, it's not routine, it's spectacular. And so in all of what God wants to do, he wants to have a circumstances at the end of the age particularly emerge that the people that are observing the church are going to step back and say, oh my, look what God has done. In today's society, the, the, the corporations and uh, places of significance are identified throughout our society today. In other words, these news agencies, some of them are great influencers of our society. I just happen to believe, just incidentally, that the real terrorists of, of our day are the media, but nevertheless. The church right now is like the 27th organization in our, in our nation that is a place of influence. We're way down the list. But as we move into these times where there's going to be a culmination of end time events, God is going to raise up a church that is super significant and it's going to catch the eye of the average person in the nations and the response from the people's heart is, oh, I can't believe that. It's it's too good to be true. Now, there's other parts in this book where God's direction and some of the declarations that he makes would prove to be something, if you, if you thought of it, you would say, I'm exaggerating it. But in the, in the, in the third chapter of the book, God sets a standard for your own life and he says, I would like for you to imagine what I'm going to do in your life. Because I'm able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think. So go ahead and imagine your life, and God can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think. And so when Paul introduces this uh, in, in the first chapter, in the 17th and 18th verse, I would like to propose to you today that perhaps we're underestimating what God would like to do in the church. So. Yeah. Amen. And that, that the church, I believe God wants to be the most significant place of influence in our society, in the nations of the earth, and God is about ready to step in because he for a long period of time, has been developing us to be part of that company of people that will do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Glory. Amen. I, can I get excited about yeah. that? Yeah. I, I believe that we should be excited about that. And if I, if I could urge you to pray a prayer, I, I, I believe sometimes... My prayers, and perhaps your prayers, have been too small. I, I, I like sometimes, and I can remember this early on in ministry, I was hoping that we would have enough just to get through the month. And God, God works with people in times of difficulty and preparation Sometimes so that the only way that you can get through what you're going to get through is if God steps into that and he provides a season perhaps of some leanness in your life so that we learn to trust him. I, I, I want to, perhaps we could put up like one of these slides and it, it has to do with the hand of God in our lives preparing us 
to do what he would like us to do. Um, there's a guy that teaches out here at Fuller Theological Seminary. Where is that in relation to where we're at? Fuller Theological Seminary. His name is Robert Clinton. I don't know if he's still on the staff there or not. Is he, is he like a professor emeritus or something? He's written a book called The Making of a Leader. I'm having trouble with this. Perhaps it's on the wrong ear. If I had a third ear, I would put it on there because I've changed it twice. Um, maybe I'm just going to use the other microphone. This is kind of distracting to me. Okay, so... Here. Take that all off, bro. We're done with that. Bro. Yeah, we're yeah, we're done. Okay. So, Robert Clinton says this. What he did is he studied every leader in church history. And then with his students, he studied every leader that he could find in in, in the Bible. And he came up with a pattern. And the pattern actually should be encouraging to us. He says that basically he, he can break down the dealings of God in any person that he dealt with or, is, or um, was developing into a significant place of influence. He breaks down the dealings of God into what he called training and then development. And so... For Moses, his training was in the schools of Egypt, but his development was in a wilderness. And so the, it's, the way he defines it, it's like the unseen hand of God working behind the scenes to develop what he would like the outcome to be in your life. And listen to this part. He makes this season of preparation... Long enough and hard enough to bring about change in our character. So like if you, if you could page, to, uh, thank you, I thank you for finding that. It's amazing you found that. But he, God brings distress in our lives. He lets that happen like he did with Joseph in prison. For instance, in Moses' life, please don't let this discourage you. You know, they tell me at Morningstar, don't tell the students this. Because the students are there and they want to come to their place of destiny tomorrow. And we'd like for them to get there tomorrow too. But the pattern is, is that there's a developmental season that goes on in all of our lives. And in this developmental season, for instance, in the, they, this is what they really tell me not to tell the students. It's two-thirds of the life of Moses. You, just, you look at Exodus chapter 1 and 2, and then you look at Exodus 3 through the end of the book of Deuteronomy. The first 80 years of Moses are in two chapters. But the time where God injects him into his primary place of usage is Exodus 3 through the end of the book. And so there's this season that goes on, Clinton discovered, in everybody's life in order to bring you to your place of destiny. It's where the primary purpose for which God has created you, the opportunity then is setting itself on the stage in front of you and what you virtually need to do is to step into that. However, here's, here's the contradiction of all of this. When people are in this season of preparation, they have had something planted in their heart by the living God. Like Joseph had a dream at 16 or 17 years old and between the time of the fulfillment of the dream and the time that he gets the dream, God left a lot out. It's called divine editing. I'm not going to tell you this part. Because if I told you this part, you may not walk that way. But while, you're, while Joseph is in the prison, the contradiction of the circumstances for the fulfillment of what God has called him to do are so overpowering 
that the, that the light of that dream begins to fade. And it comes to a place where the contradiction is so strong that you begin to question the destiny that you know is down deep in there. Are, you, are we tracking together? But I, I, I want to tell you this. This is the season in which we're not just being prepared individually, we're being prepared corporately, and there's a lot of contradictions out there that will tell you there's no way you're going to get there but God. You study, I, I've studied this out. Go back when you have some quiet moments and study Moses' language as little as you can find in the when he's emerging from Egypt and he's trying to deliver Israel and then study his language after his season of wilderness experience. At 40, this is, this is something that I've walked through and I suspect that many of you are, are, have walked through also. At 40, Moses thinks he's ready, but he's not ready. At 80, he's ready, but he thinks he's not ready. And his language is indicative of, I'm not ready. And so this process repeats itself over and over. This pattern repeats itself over and over and over again. So when God is now making an open door for you to walk into this level of opportunity and influence... Most individuals will not believe it. And in the life of Abraham, he's now come to a place where he has been promised a son. And over the, the time period of, that he has worked his way through, the diminishing of what God promised him, like he wanted to, be, he wanted to make him a father to nations, is now, I just want a kid. I just want a son. He wanted, God wanted to make him a father to nations, and all he wanted was, I just want a son. And so it has a way of eroding the, the significance of the way God wants to use you and how he wants to have you have impact, but because of the wind that you have been encountering, swimming upstream in a, is a good analogy, you begin to wear down and all you would like is for the adversity to stop and just a little bit of a break with God. We've lived that. You've lived that. But what the word of the Lord that's coming to us is don't think too small with what God wants to do with your life and I underestimate the significance of the impact for which God has created you in an hour, get this part, in an hour when most of the prophetic promises that God has compacted into the end of the age are about ready to come to pass and he's put you in this sliver of time. The eternal destiny that God had for you before the foundations of the earth is about ready to unfold, but we can limit God just like Israel limited God. And so I would like to, to simplify this message by simply saying we need to think a whole lot bigger because God wants to have a whole lot bigger impact in our lives. Wouldn't it be something... If God's destiny for your life and his call on your life birthed you into this season to preserve large portions of Southern California by your intercession. Wouldn't that be something? It's, it's not just that God would like to influence and save your children and your family. It's a whole lot bigger than this. What are there, 24 million people in this area of Los Angeles? And he puts you as a gap-standing soldier. You can prevent the flood of evil overtaking and the judgment of God, and he puts you here for this time. 
You know, you see, Marianne mentioned something about intercession, and I have been feeling this this morning when I was praying about this service. God, God not only called me to preserve my children. I, I, I'm, I'm persuaded that the encounters that I have had with God have been the thing that, by the grace of God, has kept my wife and I on track. Because we had encounters with God that we could not deny. But you better believe that my intercession for my children is that my children would simply not be observing what happened in my life because of my encounter with God. My prayer for my children and my grandchildren is that they would have their encounters with God that would transform their life and I'm a regular participant in prayer and activity for my children and grandchildren that the things that set me on this course would be encounters that they would have with God that would cause them never to deviate from the things that God wants them to do. I will tell you this, my children respect the call of God in my life and they're very supportive of it and to, they're serving the Lord. But I'll tell you this, I simply don't want them to run on my steam. I want, I want something percolating in them that drives them into their spiritual destiny and I'm part of the process. I'm part of the gap standing soldier. I'm part of a hedge builder around their life that God would preserve their destiny. When Job is, uh, has this encounter with, with the living God, and Satan goes up to heaven and he's talking to the Lord about it. He says, you have built a hedge around, around Job and all that is his. We have the capacity. In, Eze in the book of Ezekiel, the Lord is looking for people that were hedge builders. Hedge builders. So that the preservation of my children and my grandchildren I have the capacity, my wife and I have that capacity to build hedges of protection around that which is mine. But there's also a level of spirituality that we just don't have that for our children and grandchildren. I, 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 want, I want to interject this. My granddaughter, when she was, my, when she was 28 weeks along, it was diagnosed that she had a tumor. My granddaughter is in my daughter's womb. And when she's diagnosed with this tumor, the, di the projection of the uh, doctors, which were the best doctors in the world, said that she will be deformed, she will be like a vegetable, she will not be a normal child. And guess who went to work on that one? Our family my wife, and a whole host of other intercessors. And when she was born, all that the doctors had said did not happen, and all that we prayed did happen. The doctors told us that this young girl, her name is Sloan, her name means warrior, by the way, and she was named before we found this out. The doctors, the doctors told us in the, in the last five years, there's been three cases in the world like this. One of the children is dead, the other is not doing well, and this is the doctor. This is the best doctor in the world for this. He says, one child's dead, the other's not doing well, and then there's Sloan. That's, that's consistent hedge building and gap standing, and all glory goes to God. I watched my wife in travail and intercession for this child before this child was born. And I, I will tell you, this child is a, is a gift of God for our family. But for, for us, we don't want to limit our influence. I feel like God ex has us encounter these moments to see the significance of our prayer life and the godly outcome that it can have when we go after God in a significant way. But I want to tell you this, it's much bigger than that. God is opening nations to us. God's opening nations to us. There are, there are things that have not existed on the face of the earth, opportunities 
to go into nations, and these things are magnificent. We do prophetic roundtables all over the world, my wife and I. And we went to the, uh, the Dominican Republic. And um, the, the, the president of the nation is a believer. And we invited him to come to the round table. And he accepted. But the morning he was supposed to come, he said, I'm sorry, my schedule has changed. I won't be able to attend the round table, but I would like to invite your team to the presidential palace. And we went that night. And we sat in his office for an hour and a half prophesying to him. And he certainly appreciated all that. This was in April. In October, they passed the law to outlaw abortion in that nation. At the end of this meeting, at the end of this meeting, this is what he said to us. He said, you guys have touched me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to release $18 million and send Bibles to everybody in the nation. He did that right after that meeting. Nations are opening to us. There are things like that that are supernatural, that are beyond our capacity to orchestrate. And God wants to change nations through our intercession, through our prayers, through standing in gaps. The gap standing soldiers that is written about by Ezekiel were the bravest of the brave in those days. And when the walls of the city would be broken down, the gap standing soldiers were called to run and stand in the gap against the forces that were trying to overtake the city. And when he's using the gap standing soldier technique or term, it's not necessarily that it's just a term where somebody is supposed to stand there. These are the most fearsome individuals that prevent the city from being overtaken. And I suspect that a good portion of you are called to preserve Southern California against that which the enemy is bringing against, against us. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. But I, I will tell you this, is that the enemy is endeavoring to keep our focus and our attention uh, given to smaller things when God is trying to open to us nations or, or portions of states. 40, 40, 39 million people in California. And you might, I'm going to suggest this. You're birth for such a time as this. You're here to do something for God. And so when, when, we, when we capture the purpose for which we have been created and what, begin to walk in that, substantial things can be done that we only could imagine. And so here's, here's how I'm going to try and finish up this message. I, I, I believe that one of the primary things that God is saying to, to large portions of the church, particularly for those that touch the heart of God, like happened during worship today, he is trying to awaken those individuals to their supernatural destiny and the significance of what you can walk in. And if we will go after this, I believe great things can be done. The church needs to change at large. And I'm not speaking specifically of this church, although it may have some application. The church needs to change specifically from people that are sitting in the pew to people that are on the front line. That you can prevent certain things. You know, when my little Sloan was born, there was something about her destiny that was exposed to the rest of our family. And as we watched God answer these prayers, um, my daughter wrote a blog on this. And as difficult as those moments were, this is when she looked back, she said this, I wouldn't change or trade that experience for one thing because of all that I learned in that all that God has done. And it, there are pressures that God will put us through that may diminish us having a, a larger perspective of what God wants to do in our time. 
when God wrote the Bible, he compacted into the period of time in which we live in a large portion of the destinies of people into this section of time and he isolated the greatest promises that he would ever fulfill in the face of the earth, those things are going to unfold in our time. There's going to be a church that's going to emerge, a glorious church, without spot, without wrinkle. These, these individuals that are going to, and I, I, I trust that we're among this company, these individuals will do things that have never been done on the earth. Jesus said greater works are going to happen. And it, we're all pressing in to be a part of this. And for any of you that might be aging, <laughs> I, I, I want to tell you this. I'm 72 years old. This is what I want to tell you. The greatest stuff that ever happened in Daniel's life happened after he was 68 years old. From 68 to 88. All that stuff. There was only three things that happened before he was 68 years old. I mean, he interpreted a dream. There was another dream that, that was interpreted. But Daniel in the lion's den didn't happen until he was 83 years old, by the way. And what I believe the Lord is saying to us that are aging, that have been through the tests of time, that have been through the gauntlet of suffering, is that your best days are yet ahead. Your most influential. You look at what Daniel did in terms of intercession. It happened in his life when he was a much older man. Significant things can happen because the preparation of God has isolated us in this season of time. And perhaps we have been honed enough that we can really be used significantly of God. Don't let anybody tell you you're too old to do what you're called to do. As a matter of fact, I just think we're just getting started. It, 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 for such a time as this, we've been created. So I want to pray that we would enlarge our thinking. Lord Jesus, help us. Help this hour that we live in. Uh, help us step up to the very thing that you've called us to do. I break off weariness. I break off discouragement. I, I, I break off the negative words that have, felt pe that have had people feel restricted in what they're called to do. And Lord, let us embrace the supernatural destiny for which you have called us in the hour that you've created us. We, we believe that we're not gonna fail you. We believe you're not gonna forsake us. And we believe, God, that you're going to do significant, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. So, Lord, I bless this congregation. Bless them. Bless their destiny. I pray for every person in this room to take every inch of ground before they leave the last, their, this place and this last breath that you've created for them. Every inch of ground that you've destined for them. Let them possess that before they have taken their last breath. And I always pray this, and a little bit more, Lord. I want that mountain in Jesus' name. Amen.